Hi, everyone. I'd like to talk a little bit tonight about the invisible boundary of self-identification. This is kind of like a gateless boundary, to paraphrase the Mumankin, that we carry around with us. It's invisible. So when I talk about self here, I'm not talking about an internal entity or anything like that, which we pretty much discount in Buddhism and in Zen. But instead, I'd like to look at the self tonight as a kind of a boundary of consciousness that can include things and can exclude things. I think there's an understanding in Zen and in Mahayana Buddhism, to put it in simple terms, that we're all connected. And sometimes we have a stronger recognition of that in some situations and with some people and not as much with others. But there are also times when that underlying connectedness comes out more strongly or is underlined. And I'll say something about that a little later. But in everyday life, we can say there is this kind of invisible membrane or boundary, and it's one of the mind rather than a physical thing. But it also extends into our interactions and reactions with people and things. We've come a long way as organisms from the beginnings of organized biological life as a single-celled creature like an amoeba. But in many ways, ourselves are a lot like those amoebas. The amoebas came out of the soup of living material and became the first organized cellular beings. And they had a very rudimentary kind of consciousness and nervous system. And you can say that with the amoeba started the sense of separation and personal self. The system is very simple. If they come across something to eat or something that's good for them, they surround it with their boundary. They can actually open their membrane and surround it and take it in and let it into their membrane. And if they come across something that is an irritant or a danger, they shrink away from it, close the membrane, and can even slither away from it. So this tiny little one-celled creature has a basic fight or flight mechanism, which is carried through to more complex organisms. And it also represents self and other on a very basic level. So you can say the amoeba has this sense of self in relation to its environment, which it sees as separate. You could say that on a physical level, when that amoeba opens up and lets something into its membrane, it is expanding its boundary of self and including that thing in its boundary of self. So in a sense, it becomes part of itself. The self, you could say, is in a constant process of forming and reforming, closing and opening, expanding and shrinking. And on a more subtle level, we do the same thing. We have our invisible barrier or psychic membrane that is employed to distinguish what we consider or want to include as part of ourself or reject as outside of ourself. On the way to realizing the reality of the all-inclusive selfless self, the no boundary self, which may be the discovery and the goal of Mahayana and Zen, we can observe this reality to some extent and also see how we form and reform our sense of self or inclusiveness. So we don't have a permanent or solid unchanging self. We have a constantly changing and adapting sense of self, so to speak. So let's say that someone just rubs us the wrong way. You know, as a human amoeba, your little sensors that you have on your invisible boundary membrane may get activated by you and think that they're just not right for you and you shrink away from them. You separate from them. Note to self, I'm going to avoid this person. I don't want to be around them. So it raises a question if we're striving to satisfy the bodhisattva principles and the Mahayana ideals, this person could be pretty lonely if they give other people this same reaction. They may be seen as other by other people as well, that there, and there may be something seen as wrong with them. Can I be the person who is able to get past my aversion and extend my self boundary towards that person? It could be an interesting challenge, and sometime I may be that person who is rejected. So if I see the other person as potentially like me or a part of my larger self, then I may empathize with them rather than reject them. Maybe sometimes I can do this and sometimes I can't, but if I can, I've rejected a version and I've dissolved some of the separation in my sense of self and other under a difficult circumstance where the self wants to close off and create separation. 
And then there's the other case where I really, really like someone and I'd like to be closer to them. And then my self membrane gets out of control and wants to engulf them. So you might think that is a good example of non-separation, but it's not because my separate self wants to get rid of their boundary rather than mine. Yes, I want to expand, but in a way that gets something for the self rather than dissolving the boundary. So in that case, can I resist the craving and allow that person to have their own self-definition? It also suggests a healthy balance between non-self boundary and healthy self boundary. To be sympathetic, to let others in, but not try to consume them with our self boundary or with our self needs. Because in truth, we're then not treating them like ourself, but we're regarding them like the amoeba as a kind of food for ourself. And we don't want to eat people up and consume them like they were a thing. It's worth contemplating to what extent we treat people like objects or food or something to acquire rather than as living sentient beings in their own right. Do we see the full humanity of the guy or gal at the grocery store? Do we smile or acknowledge them or give them a kind word? Or are we just focused on checking out and getting the hell out of there? To evolve beyond the amoeba seems to take a lot of work and a healthy awareness of our own wholesome and unwholesome tendencies of self. So one other thing, I mentioned earlier that sometimes we find ourselves in situations that bring out and underline our connection to each other. And we have an example of that happening in our society right now. I've been watching the trial of the police officer who killed George Floyd. And a lot of what happened there has been enraging and also very well known for a number of months, as you might expect. But there's been an element of the trial that is brand new that I did not expect or know about. And it's a very telling phenomenon, one that is so striking that it's gotten the repeated attention of news commentators. Almost every witness who testified in this trial felt guilty that they could not save George Floyd's life. These are the witnesses. It was almost universal, young and old, black and white, people who were on the scene felt most horrible that they couldn't or didn't do something different to save George Floyd even though they tried and in every case couldn't get the officers to respond. As if it were their personal responsibility. And I thought that was very moving. About half of the witnesses burst into tears when they were testifying. And this is someone they didn't know. On this very deep life and death level, everyone who saw what happened regarded George Floyd as an extension or part of their own self, their personal responsibility. They experienced that unity that included or incited metta, loving kindness towards him and karuna, compassion, and wished to help him. But more than that, they felt it was up to them. And I reflected that I also felt that way when my parents died. Somehow I felt that I personally should have been able to keep them alive. In some way, we're so united with each other on a deep level, so connected on a mysterious level, that physical reality seems like it shouldn't stop us, even though it so often does. I thought that was a good example of going beyond our amoeba origins to care as much about someone else's plight as we do about our own. Maybe we have evolved and can evolve just a little bit. Thank you.